All right, if you have your Bibles with you then, we'd ask you to turn to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 3, and we're going to begin reading in verse 20. Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 20. Paul, writing to the church at Rome, says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. But by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all, upon all them that believe. And there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a perpetuation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of, the, of him that believeth in Jesus. Lord, we thank you and we praise you uh, for your protection to our church. God, we pray that we might somehow in the day that we live be an outreach, uh, that we would still be about your business, that we would uh, uh, share the wonderful news of the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, that we would uh, uh, beg people to enter, Lord, that they might hear uh, the gospel. God, we pray that you would uh, strengthen, us, strengthen us as brethren and sisters together, Lord, that you would cause us to be close and near unto thee. And we pray these things in the sweet and the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Now, uh, some fairly familiar verses of scripture and like many of the churches that Paul wrote to, the church at Rome was going awry. You can read Romans chapter 1 and many of the pagan customs that were picked up by the Roman Catholic Church are already well in place by the time of this writing. Uh, a lot of what they do, he warns them of, of idols and things that look like gods that they still even have today. Uh, images of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, images of Mary, and all that goes with it, uh, Paul saw it coming even then. Now, even more detrimental than idolatry to the church at Rome is compromising what salvation is about, making it something that it's not. And every falsehood that exists always bases on this, making salvation something that it's not. Yeah. Uh, making it less than grace. Now everybody says, well, if you have to work, that's more than grace. No, no, it's less than grace and it belittles our Lord. Uh, we'll see from our text, if the law had been sufficient, there would have been no need for the Lord Jesus Christ even to come. Uh, but it wasn't sufficient. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't what we needed. Uh, words on a page cannot change a man's life. All that can change a man's life is the Lord Jesus Christ. And as Paul is writing out for the, the church there at Rome, he wants this to be very sure in their hearts. So he begins in verse 20, Therefore by the deeds of the law... There shall no flesh be justified in his sight. So all those things that the law, uh, I think maybe later in this writing or maybe in the writing to the Hebrew church, he, sa he says this, that the law is simply a schoolmaster. Uh, a schoolmaster tells you what is wrong and what is right. But see, a schoolmaster, uh, when, I, when I was a nursing instructor, I could tell my students how to do it, but once they were on their own, I had no idea what they were doing. I was just telling them the right way. That was, that was the extent of the law. Uh, and just telling us right from wrong. Now, 
Unfortunately, our nature is bent always toward wrong. Yeah. Always toward wickedness, always toward vileness, and in that sense, we're always gonna make the wrong decision. That 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 is our nature uh, from the beginning. So Paul writing the church at Rome, he wanted them to be understood the position of the law was not for redemption. For by the law, the rest of verse 20, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. What is right? What is wrong? What, what, what consists of sin? What consists of righteousness? The only purpose of the law. Verse 21, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. In other words, a, a righteousness uh, to convey what's right and wrong is now the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. One of his greatest ministry was showing compassion on people that didn't deserve it. The Samaritan woman at the well, uh, the woman who had been taken in the act of uh, adultery, uh, the, the, the lame man being uh, brought to help. Oh, none of those people deserved what they got but he brought it to him anyway. He became what the law could not do. Amen. Amen. He uh, he could change within us, uh, change our nature when there was nothing else to be done. And so Paul reminds them of this in the person of Christ. Verse of, the rest of verse twenty one, being witnessed by both the law and the prophets. Now. Uh, what he is saying here that the law, the original law given by Moses, it had the very picture of Christ in how they were to offer sacrifices. The full story of the law was this, is blood for sin. That's the whole story of the law, and, and it told him well, and then the prophets came and, and were saying even then, there comes one to justify many, Isaiah 53. He said then, he's coming, and what? He's for everyone? Not what the scripture says, it says he's for many. many. All right. and, and so we see then that, uh, <laughs> And we know from the ministry of Paul, the Jews hated that and rejected it. Uh, now, I can't quite get my mind around why they would hate redemption that comes to everybody. But they did. They wanted for the Jew and the Jew alone. And uh, years ago, I had, a, I had a friend of mine, uh, and she was talking about uh, different rooms in heaven. She was telling a joke. And... Uh, and she said, they walked by this one room and it's just like turned up on one side, people screaming. They're like, well, that's the Pentecostal room. And then they went by the Church of Christ room and she said, shh, shh, they think they're the only ones here. And that was the attitude of the Jew. They wanted to be the only ones. And so with that, we find that the Lord Jesus Christ, through his mercy, and through his grace, he brought it to us. He brought it to us simply and freely by grace. Verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith. Now, you have to measure your own faith tonight. I can't help you do that. But do you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Can you face eternity that's still ahead of every one of us depending on Christ and Christ alone. That's all there is. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ made it so easy. Uh, a child could understand it. Faith and faith alone. Yet and still faith is a gift. Uh, I often think about that elderly gentleman that worked for the FBI that went to the Bumpus Mills Church. Y'all remember that guy? Very unusual fella. And when the Lord saved him, very, very intelligent man. But faith came as a gift, did it not? Do you really believe the Lord Jesus Christ lived a sinless life and died on your behalf? That's the only faith I have. 
That, that's all I'm trusting in. And really, that's all any person can trust in. There's nothing left. And, and so we find as Paul is writing to the church at Rome, he was giving them some clear reminders of what true salvation consisted of, plus nothing, minus nothing, faith. Even the righteousness of God, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith, of Jesus Christ. Now, notice where you're to put that faith in. Not the law, not in some kind of flippy flop experience, just in Christ. Very, very simple, is it not? Just placing your faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and then all that is, huh, is rolled away. Yeah. And the glorious thing is, it is. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Jesus Christ, unto all unto all and upon all them that believe this little sentence at the end it always heard that a colon means that the rest of it can stand alone for there is no difference now that was that was the g that was the crook for the jew there is no difference i think in again in hebrews uh, the writer writes, there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. And that was very upsetting to those people. Now certainly we should always preach all truth. But don't look down your nose at anybody. If, it, if it's the most raging <laughs> Pentecostal, you know, you, you approach them with kindness. Because you know what? Without the intervention of God, you'd be the exact same way. And you can put Pentecostal, you can erase that and put anything you want to in that blank, and the end's the same. Kindness. Mm -hmm. and, and I didn't know this at the time, and uh, uh, there was a gentleman here, and I won't get into details, but uh, one of the members at that time approached him in a snotty way. He's a different, different type altogether. You know what? That accomplished nothing. Right. It accomplished nothing. Uh, much better to say, no, we can't do that, but we'll be praying for you. And leave it at that. And, and, and so we find then as the Lord's people that <clears throat> uh, Paul reiterates again and again and again, plus nothing, minus nothing, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 25, whom God has set forth at, to be a per perpetuation. A payment, a something to even the balance, something to settle the scale, to settle the score, to make it all balance once again. He made the payment for me and you. You know, sometimes I stand amazed, and this is when you know that it's all of grace, that he would waste time on me. That he would waste the effort on my behalf, but he certainly did. That, that, that's amazing in and of itself. He became my payment, my propitiation. He paid a debt that I could not. That's the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Plus nothing, minus nothing. Uh, uh, oh, glory be to him, because if it hadn't been for his intervention, even tonight, I would be justified to be on my way to hell. You know, I had someone say to me one time, well, Brother Larry, I don't think that uh, everybody deserves to uh, go to hell. And I guess I was flabbergasted, and I thought for a moment, and I said, well, introduce me to one, because everyone that I've ever met does deserve to go to hell. And he didn't have much to say after that. Uh, we're damned already, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If Christ doesn't intervene, right. uh, that, that, that's where we'll be. And, and so we find that what our, our, our chief benefit, our only, uh, our only cause, our only uh, claim when we stand before the Almighty is the Lord Jesus Christ, the propitiation, our payment of sin through faith. Again, we get back to faith. How much do you trust Him? How much do you believe in Him? Where, 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 does, your, uh, where does your confidence lie? And the only thing that I can claim is the Lord Jesus Christ through faith in His blood. 
Now, I don't know this, but I honestly, quite honestly, don't read them. Uh, occasionally, I see stuff about other versions on Facebook, and this has been removed, and that has been removed. But I know, uh, I have been told that, especially the more modern translations, have pretty much taken the blood out. They say it's a glory religion. You know what it is. It's gory. A blood-bought faith. But that is what it is. Is it disgusting? Maybe. Is it gory? Is it sickening? Maybe. But it is what bought our sin. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking uh, about this in preparation. And uh, you've got to see a lot of blood to appreciate it. Right. Now, uh, if I had a cup of blood, I could sling it over this way and this way, and it would look unbelievable. And that's just one cup. But uh, the body holds anywhere from uh, six to eight pints of blood. That's three quarts. It's almost a gallon. Can you imagine what that would look like? How gory. And some adult men have much more than that. A lady who's specking a child has twice that much. And all that being shed on our behalf. All that being done for us. Is it gory? You bet you. But that was the only way it could be done. Mm -hmm. There was nothing else left to offer. Uh, Lord Jesus Christ, huh, on time and eternity, he said, yes, I'll go. I'll go for mine. I'll go for them. And he did just that. Uh, uh, notice the rest of verse 25. To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Everything that I've ever done. To declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness shall that he might be just and the justifier of him which believe, believeth in Jesus. Now, just to believe that there was a man called Jesus is one thing, but to believe that he is the mediator between uh, man and the Lord God of heaven, that's quite another. To believe that he died individually for your sin, for, you, for him to awaken you to the very fact that he is the redeemer, that's a totally, totally different thing. See, Jesus is our intercessor. We don't, the Bible teaches us we don't even know what to pray for. Right. And you know, sometimes when I begin to pray, I mean, I have just to say the scripture's right on point, isn't it? Uh, have you ever been so down and out in all these studies that Adam has given us concerning David has, has made me understand that better you don't even know what to pray for anymore you truly don't even know what to say you don't even know how to ask the almighty to intervene I've been there, I've been there more than once and about all you can do you remember this song where David says that his, belt, his bed was wet with tears. Sometimes you get to that point, don't you? But see, in that point, he's trustworthy. He's tr Yes, you don't know what to do, but he certainly does. Mm -hmm. He can still go as an intercessor just with our weeping tears and present it to God to something beautiful and glorifying and accomplish great good. That's who, huh, that's who we are. That's, he is our intercessor. That's who he is. We can do nothing, and he can do all. That is the story of an effective intercessor. Verse 27. Where is boasting then? Doesn't exist, correct? It can't be. Uh, you ever saw the pomp and circumstance of a Catholic service? I, I've seen it on TV, and I had a really good friend that 
was Catholic when I was a boy. I had two, but one, with, they both were named Paul, by the way, which I thought was interesting. But Paul Lamb, he's gone now. He was a year older than me. He would tell me about their services. And of course, you know, I was a country bumpkin. I mean, at that time, there were no Catholic churches anywhere. They had to go to Clarksville to do their thing. And uh, you know what? It, sat, it sounded interesting. It sounded neat. He'd tell me about the robes, and, and uh, uh, he said he was an altar boy and what all that involved. It sounded very, very interesting. But you know what? It's to tickle their fancy. It's to keep them in, in, in line. It's to keep them in grip in what's going on. And so as Paul is writing to the church at Rome, the church, the church I believe who would defect and be the mother of all harlots, he says very simply, there is. Where is, where is boasting then? There, boasting doesn't exist. It is excluded. No place for it. No to say how great I am. No to say what I, nothing to say, oh, I've done this, I've done that. I, none of that exists. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. How, how deep and strong is your faith this evening? How dependent on are you on it? Uh, it's a, a strange day to live, isn't it? Yesterday was Thomas' birthday. And this shows how long we've been together. I got her some flowers. And uh, we we're talking on the phone. And I said, well, what do you want for your birthday supper? And she goes, I don't know, you want me to pick it up while I'm in town? <laughs> so we've been together a long, long time. And she was going to get a cake. She do not want to eat it herself, but she's going to get a cake for me and the girls. And uh, she came back with one slice of cake for me and Bella to split. And that was four bucks. <laughs> that's where we're at. You know, that's pretty scary, isn't it? Kind of comical. But I think Donna said, uh, if she got the whole cake, it'd be like 20 something bucks. Maybe more than that. No, I guess, let's say four times eight, $32, something like that. It was six Crazy, isn't it? You know what? I think it'll come a day very soon where we would be glad to get a cake for 32 bucks. See, no, the only certainty that lies is your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only certainty we have. And so Paul reminds them, look at your faith. Look at your faith. Look at what you put confidence in. Look where, you're, where you've relied on. Have you ever thought about it? And, and here in the South, it's so easy to preach on it and so easy to think about it. But think about those poor people that are, are, are praying to Mary, a woman long since dead, to be their intercessor. That's scary, is it not? You know where they've put their faith? In a woman that's been dead for over 2,000 years. Yeah. That's scary, isn't it? Not to be made fun of. That's a, that's, a, that's a scary, dire situation for so many, many people, is it not? We, uh, we need to be in prayer for those people. Where, wherein have you placed your faith? Nothing could be more important to answer. Verse 28. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? He is, not, is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, seeing he is one God, which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. Both through faith. So tonight, I guess the best question is where have you placed your faith? 
Now here in a group this small that uh, I think are very strong Baptists for the day in which we live, uh, our faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that it will be. You know what the problem of Armenian doctrine is this? How many people have put their faith in that little prayer? You know what? That's no, that's no different than saying, Hail Mary, Mother of Grace. It really isn't, is it? it, it in fact, it's the very same thing, is it not? Has he given you faith? Now go back to me, verse 10, and I promise I'm almost done. Uh, Romans 3, verse 10, as it, as it is written, There is none that is righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used to see. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. The way of peace they have not known. Now that's the condition of a sinner. No peace. You ever notice that lost people constantly keep themselves busy? You know why? They have no peace. See, when you're by yourself and you're quiet, you have to think about you, don't you? You have to think about you, the Lord God, at least your children. Just honesty. You know what? I feel like the express purpose of these are not just for a communication device, not just for the government to keep up where we're at. They're this right here all the time. Uh -huh. You don't have to think about anything, do you? You have the world at your fingertips. You know, would to God the internet would go down and we had to contemplate this a little bit. You have to contemplate where you're going to spend time in eternity because it's coming. It's coming. And people who are uncertain, I point you to the Lord Jesus Christ.